Hey there, Slashaholics. Because this channel cannot be monetized through YouTube, we depend on the generosity of you amazing Slashaholics to keep us going and growing for years to come. If you enjoy what we do here on the channel and would like to see us continue, then please consider joining our Patreon or donating to the channel through our PayPal, Cash App, or by ordering a fun Cameo video. This is the only way to fund the channel, and we would greatly appreciate your support. Please enjoy tonight's narration of Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, the fan novelization by Jeremy Terry. Interlude 1, from the Journal of Elias Voorhees, found among the papers of Pamela Voorhees, March 4, 1945. I am in hell. I can hear my darling Pamela sobbing in the bedroom as I write this entry. Three miscarriages in the span of two years and now this, this travesty. The baby girl was stillborn. Pamela suffered a day and a half in labor and her only reward was to hold the small corpse against her bosom. I have just returned from placing the wooden cross I fashioned for her last night. The marker bears only her date of birth, as Pamela could not bring herself to name the child. I fear for her sanity. I found her sitting in the nursery yesterday, talking to the wall as though someone were there, responding to her statements. That gave me quite a fright, so I called for Dr. French to make a house call. He has come several times since to see to my wife's needs, once giving her a spoonful of laudanum to ease her pain and help her to sleep for a time, perchance to escape the despair of the waking world. He has said that she must not get pregnant again, that the stress on her body would be enough to kill her. I have not had the heart to tell Pamela this. I fear I am to blame, though Pamela would never say it was so. I believe that the same condition that made me ineligible to serve our country in the war against Hitler is the cause of all our great sadness. Now, I will be the cause of her salvation. I believe I have found a way. I have been in contact with the man from Boston who is broker in the sale of an exceptionally rare book. It is one of only three known copies of the work in existence and... The purchase of it has cost me almost everything I own. I am told that the first copy is held in the library of the Miskatonic University at Arkham, Massachusetts, and the second is part of the private collection of an Arab prince. I am not a rich man, and am told that the owner of the third book is offering it at a price low enough for me because he greatly desires to be rid of the thing and wash his hands of all of it. The broker of the cell tells me that a terrible tragedy occurred involving the deaths of several of the current owner's family members. I hurt for the man to be sure, but I rejoice that this misfortune may turn out to be our blessing. I leave this evening to meet the broker at the train station where I will complete the deal and take possession of the tome. I can't help feeling that our fortunes are about to change. Chapter 3 Bad News The muffled drone of a semi-truck passing by on the road in front of Joey B's diner reached Diana Kimball where she stood in the break room at the rear of the restaurant. The early morning sun shone down on her through the single small window, settling in her hair like liquid gold. She was in her mid-forties with the face and figure of someone fifteen years her junior. She was a vision in her pink waitress uniform and white apron in spite of the clouds forming on her furrowed brow. She crossed her arms and leaned forward, all her attention fixed on the small television set resting on an old wooden box in the corner. 
The screen faded to black as a staccato melody began to play. And then the image of a white hockey mask bloomed on the screen with the words, American Case File, superimposed over it in bright red letters, the color of arterial blood. The mask vanished and was replaced by the image of a handsome young man dressed in a blue suit and tie. His hair was brown, his face stern and serious, giving him the air of someone who took no flack from anyone. Tonight on American Case File, he said, Jason Voorhees, dead or dead Lee? The scene shifted to show a graphic photograph of the two FBI agents who had the unfortunate luck to be assigned to guard the morgue where Jason's body was taken. Blood covered the walls above the two men who lay beside an overturned desk in a crumpled heap. Next came the picture of the boyish coroner's assistant, Eric Pope, and finally a picture of coroner Philip Hunt. These dramatic photos were taken in the aftermath of the autopsy of Jason Voorhees, mere hours after his death at the hands of federal forces. The facts. Two security men dead. A coroner's assistant dead. Another coroner missing. Are these men victims of a serial killer only believed to be deceased? Many say yes. The screen changed again to show the handsome host standing alone in a television studio. He looked straight into the camera, seeming to stare into the very souls of his captivated audience. Hi, I'm Robert Campbell. For over 20 years, the mere mention of the name Jason Voorhees has been enough to send a shudder of fear through the hearts of a nation. Born in 1946 to Elias and Pamela Voorhees, Jason was believed to have drowned at Camp Crystal Lake at the tender age of 11. Sadly, he did not. Since then, he has been responsible for 83 confirmed murders and speculated scores of others. Tonight, on a very special episode of American Case File, we will show footage of the exclusive interview with Mr. Creighton Duke, conducted just one week after Jason's alleged termination. Mr. Duke is the bounty hunter responsible for the capture of six of this country's most reviled serial killers. Let's go to the tape. The scene switched to a montage of footage showing a militaristic compound surrounded by a 10-foot high chain link fence with concertina wire along the top. There were flashes of a firing range, a fully equipped gym, a martial arts dojo, Campbell continued his narration over the images. For the first time ever, our cameras were allowed access to the private training facility of Creighton Duke. Duke invited us with the promise of a very unusual, very expensive proposition. I think you'll agree. In typical fashion, he gave us much more than we bargained for. The image on the TV changed again this time showing Campbell and Duke sitting at a picnic table underneath the low-hanging branches of an old oak tree. Duke sat whittling the table surface with the tip of an ornate ceremonial dagger, its handle bone, the pommel a screaming skull. I'm going to say two words to you, Campbell said, as he stared intently over his tinted fingers, and I want you to tell me the first thing you think of. Duke set the dagger down, smiling pleasantly at the reporter. Okay, shoot. Jason Voorhees. Duke's smile grew more jovial. Why, that makes me think of a little girl in a pink dress, sticking a hot dog through a donut. Campbell frowned, clearly confused by the statement. I was actually referring to your claim that Jason isn't dead. Tell me, Mr. Campbell. How many times has Jason been reported dead? Eight times, Duke nodded. Eight times. They burned him, they dipped him in nuclear waste. But, Campbell interrupted, this time they bombed him. They literally blew his body into pieces. They could have danced a jig on his corpse and then fed it to the goats. It doesn't matter. You can't kill Jason by getting rid of his body. He'll come back just like he always does to drag the kitties into the darkness and crush their little skulls. 
He may even come to crush your skull, Mr. Campbell. If the statement bothered Campbell, he didn't let it show. He smiled winningly and laughed. <laughs> Let's hope not. Yeah, that would be a shame, Duke said, staring daggers at the reporter. It was obvious Duke didn't care much for the man. Campbell cleared his throat and continued. <clears throat> In the media, you've frequently been described as salty. Look, Duke interrupted again. Let's cut the bullshit and get to the point. You want me to catch and kill Jason Voorhees for you. And I'm willing to do it. But it won't be easy. And it won't be cheap. My price is $500,000 non-negotiable. Campbell blanched at the sum. I understand what you are saying, but our audience should be aware that you only charge $50,000 to catch the Idaho skin stretcher. Skin stretcher was human, Duke said. He paused to lean closer to Campbell across the table. Let's get one thing straight, Mr. Campbell. This isn't your garden variety serial killer. There is only one way to end Jason Voorhees for all time, and I'm the only one who knows how to do it. If you want him dead, truly dead, then my fee is 500000 You know where to find me. The screen went black, and then Campbell was back up on screen standing in the television studio. That was Creighton Duke. In the week following my interview with Mr. Duke, there have been five more Jason-style murders, all not surprisingly on a direct path from the federal morgue in Youngstown, Ohio, to Crystal Lake. Tonight, in the interest of public safety, I am prepared to offer Creighton Duke his sum of $500,000, payable only after he provides American case file with incontrovertible proof of Jason's existence and then puts an end to him for all time. We'll be back with more American Case File in a moment. <laughs> Diana reached out with a trembling hand and switched the television off. It really wasn't over then. Of course it wasn't. She'd been a fool for daring to hope. A door slammed open behind her and Diana turned to see Joey, her boss and owner of the diner, she was an intimidating presence, standing over six feet tall with orange hair, so vibrant it could only have come from a bottle. She put her hands on her hips and stared down at Diana like an old school marm, about to mete out punishment to an unruly student. Excuse me, Lady Di, Joey barked, her sweaty face going an interesting shade of red. I'm sorry to cut your TV time, but there's a couple of customers who would like to eat sometime this fucking month. I really don't need this shit today, Diana thought, sighing. It was easier just to cave in and deal with Joey's attitude than to fight back. Besides, Joey really had a kind heart. It was just buried really, really deep down. I'm sorry, Joey, Diana said, following her towards the front of the restaurant. They pushed through the storage room door, and Diana froze, once again shocked at the new decorations Joey had put up the week before. Hockey masks hung suspended from the ceiling by fishing line. They twirled lazily beside a large banner that read, Jason is dead, two for one burger sale. This is truly sick, she said. Tell me about it, muttered Vicky, the diner's other waitress, as she passed by with plates of steaming food balanced precariously in her arms. She was a cute, vivacious young woman in her early twenties and a childhood friend of Diana's daughter Jessica. Diana noticed a few of the male customers following Vicky's progress across the dining area with interest. Vicky paid them no mind. This is not sick, Joey said, propping herself on the counter beside Diana. This is business. People are going to come see Jason's hometown and they're going to come with appetites. Just then, a diminutive gray-haired man stuck his head out of the kitchen service window and called to Diana. His name was Shelby and he was Joey's husband. There had been more than a few jokes made at the couple's expense over the years, some light-hearted and some exceptionally cruel. One person went so far as to insinuate that Shelby was in fact a homosexual and that Joey was his beard wife. Remembering back on that incident, Diana thought that was the only time she'd ever seen one of the jabs strike home. 
The look that Joey and Shelby had exchanged had sent a sharp sliver of pain through Diana's heart. They had looked so vulnerable. Diana grabbed the food from the window, throwing Ward Joey and Shelby's only child a wave. He was the spitting image of his mother, though he had Shelby's eyes. However odd or different they were as a couple, all Diana needed to see was their son smiling in the kitchen, and there was living proof of their love. Ma, Ward said, as he stuck his head through the window, showing everyone a raw hamburger patty cut in the shape of a hockey mask. Do you really want me to cut these like this? They look stupid. Joey pushed off from the counter and walked into the kitchen, grabbing a patty of meat from the preparation area. Well, that's your dumbass fault. They're supposed to look like hockey masks. Now watch. They all stood enthralled as Joey scoped eyes and little breathing holes from the patty and then held the ball of meat she had removed up for them to see. You see, this will make a whole new patty, hence the two-for-one special. God, I love this woman, Shelby shouted, wrapping his arms around Joey's waist and smiling up at her. Give me some sugar. Joey bent over and the two kissed passionately while Diana chuckled and Ward mimed vomiting into a salad bowl. They separated and Shelby placed a few more orders into the window. These are for table three, Di. Diana picked the plates up and walked around to the front of the counter where a familiar figure was sitting beside a young uniformed deputy sheriff. The young man is handsome in his red shirt and wire-rimmed glasses. The expression is different now, much changed from six months ago. His name is Stephen Freeman, and he's had what you could call a life-changing incident. Diana set his plate down on the counter in front of him, thinking that it was sad that he had to lose the love of his life before he could grow up. Hey, Diana, Stephen said, gently putting a hand on her arm to hold her attention. Have you heard from Jessica recently? There was such pain behind those eyes. Diana turned away before she gave in and revealed more information than her daughter would want her to. Yeah, I have, she said, walking away. Stephen watched her go and then turned back to morosely play with his food. Hey, buck up, said Randy, his friend, as he slid back from the counter and patted Stephen on the shoulder. That was progress, brother. At least she gave you something. Yeah, I'll try. Randy walked over to table three and joined Deputy Josh and Sheriff Landis as Diana began to hand out plates. Josh, here's your burger with a side of fries. Randy, here's your double burger with a side of onion rings. Thank you, Di, said Josh, scratching his bushy mustache with one finger before digging in. You're welcome, Diana said, turning to Landis and handing him his meal with a wink. One meatloaf with a side of me. Damn, Josh said with raised eyebrows. Where was that listed on the menu? I would have ordered a couple. Hey, watch it now, Landis said. You keep moving in on my woman, and I might have to take you out back and shoot you. Josh snorted into his glass of sweet tea. Yeah, I've seen you shoot. You two are great together, Randy said. I think you two should go ahead and get married. Silence fell at the table, and Randy shuddered, certain by the look in everyone's eyes that he had made a mistake. Landis finished chewing his food and swallowed. He glanced up to judge Diana's demeanor, and then turned his full attention on the young deputy. I'm sorry, son. I'm going a bit deaf in my old age. What did you just say? Randy blanched. I, I, I said I think I'll eat my meal over by Stephen and shut the hell up. That's exactly what I thought you said, Landis said. He waited until Randy had walked over to join Stephen before he looked back to Diana. She was pretty as a field of flowers in early spring, though she looked a little run down. He reached out and squeezed her hand, hoping for a smile. Everything going okay? It's going, she answered noncommittally. Are your legs giving you trouble? They aren't so bad today. Thanks for asking, doll. Landis grinned, turning to catch Stephen watching them from his seat at the counter. The young man grimaced and turned away. Is Stephen still bugging you? he asked, fist clenched beneath the table. Diana sighed. Do you have to ask? Josh rolled his eyes, stuffing the last of his french fries into his mouth. 
Jesus H. Christ, he's relentless. Persistence isn't always a virtue, Landis said. I wish you would let me talk to him, Diana. All I need is three minutes alone with him. He won't ever bother you or Jessica again. Ed, just leave him be. Stephen doesn't mean any harm. He's hurting. I can handle him. Okay, Landis said, throwing his hands up in surrender. So how is Jessica? Have you talked to her lately? She's great, Diana replied. That kid takes everything in stride. I wonder where she gets that from. Diana patted him on the hand and stepped back. I've got to get back to work. Sure, love, Landis said. I'll call you later. He watched her go and then turned back to Josh. Josh wiped his chin with a napkin, smiling at his boss. Don't say it, Landis warned. Josh hummed the opening bars of the wedding march and then laughed. I tell you what, Landis said, scowling at him. I'll make you a deal. I'll marry Diana when you stop banging Edna and decide to focus on your own wife. Josh dropped his crumpled napkin on his plate and sighed. Oh well, poor lonely Diana. Across the diner, the subject of their conversation stepped up to a man sitting in a booth by himself, an open newspaper blocking her view of his face. She took one look at the headline and felt her gorge rise. Of course, it was about the murders. What else would it be about? What can I get you? She asked, trying to put her fears out of her mind. I'll take a Voorhees burger with the side of Jason Fingus, the man replied, lowering the newspapers to smile up at her. Diana took a step back, shocked. She recognized the patron, had just seen him on the television minutes before. He extended his hand. Creighton Duke. I know who you are, Diana said, shaking his hand. Did you know that I grew up in a little town not far from here? I spent quite a few afternoons on the lake when I was a snot-nosed little kid. Diana pulled her hand away. No, I didn't know that. Duke smiled. There aren't too many folks that do. I expect you're wondering why I'm here. I can guess. I saw your interview on TV this morning. Duke nodded. I can't say I'm a big fan of that pompous pencil neck reporter, but he's paying the bills. Listen, I need to talk to you. It's important. I'm a little busy right now. Something flashed in Duke's eyes, and Diana felt a chill run down her spine. There was hard steel running under the man's gentle smile, shark's teeth waiting to bite and tear. I'm going to kill Jason Voorhees, and I need your help to do it. Dread bloomed in her chest, made it hard to draw breath. Jason is dead, Mr. Duke. Everyone knows that. Duke gave her a sympathetic grin, shaking his head. You know he's not. He's still out there, and he's coming for you, Diana. No, she said, her voice far too loud, drawing the attention of several patrons around them. That's crazy talk. Your food will be out shortly. She turned to go, but halted when he spoke again. I will give you $10,000. No, I... Uh, 20000 Look, $30,000, Duke said. More. Just name your price. Everyone has one. What's yours? Look, I don't want your money. Duke paused, considering his smile gone. Fine, then. Maybe I should offer it to your daughter. Anger flared on Diana's face, and she leaned on the edge of the table, eye to eye with Duke. What do you want from me? Duke stared back at her, unperturbed. You know what I want. You know why I need you. Diana straightened up, crossing her arms protectively over her chest. You need to leave. I know everything about you. Diana spun to go. That's it. We're done. No, we're not, Duke said, raising his voice for the first time. I know who you really are. Diana froze, her stomach tied in knots. It was impossible. How could this stranger know? Sheriff Landis had seen enough. He pushed past Diana with Josh and Randy on his heels, and the three uniformed officers loomed over Duke. The bounty hunter sized each one up and then smirked unimpressed. 
What's the problem here? Landis said, husband hand resting menacingly on the butt of his holster revolver. Diana put a hand on his shirt sleeve. Nothing is wrong. Let's just leave it be. I was making your girlfriend an offer and she's thinking it over. Right, love? Landis bustled at Duke's familiar... <laughs> Landis bristled at Duke. Maybe you should be moving on. Duke raised one eyebrow. Maybe you should mind your own business. Landis saw red, a vein pulsing at his temple. Get up! Why don't you blow me, chief? Duke asked, in the tone of someone asking how their neighbor's children are doing in school. After your girlfriend gets through first, of course. You son of a bitch! Landis shouted. He raised his fist and took a swing at Duke. The bounty hunter moved like lightning, catching the sheriff's punch and stopping it cold. Just as quickly. Landis had his revolver out and he was pressing the muzzle into Duke's jaw. Duke just smiled up at the sheriff as if he was having the time of his life. Landis dug the gun barrel in further, trying to hurt. That's my lady you're talking about. Well, chief, Duke said, she's only your lady because she ain't had a taste of the Duke yet. God damn it! Landis forced Duke to his feet and Josh grabbed the man's other arm. Careful, chief, Duke said. I don't think you know who I am. I know who you are, growled Landis. The last thing we need around here is some freak show bounty hunter making trouble. I want you out of town and I want you out of town now. That's very colorful, chief. Landis turned to Randy, motioning for the young deputy to take Duke's arm from him. Take him to my car. I'll be out in a minute. Come on, Randy said. He tried to lead Duke, but Duke wasn't finished yet. The bounty hunter held his ground with ease and looked to Diana. He's coming for you, Diana. He's coming for you and your daughter. Lock your doors. With this final pronouncement made, he allowed himself to be escorted from the diner. Diana watched him go with a sense of doom, spiraling ever closer to her and her family. Duke's last words to her echoed through her mind. She thought she would hear them tonight in her dreams. Are you all right? Landis asked. I'm sorry that he upset you. Diana spun on him, surprising him into taking a step back. Her eyes were alight with fresh anger. I don't need you to fight my battles for me, she hissed. I don't, nor do I want part-time protection. Landis studied her for a moment, and she saw hurt in his eyes hurt that she had caused with her sharp tongue. Still the words were said, and she meant them. Landis nodded once and walked out the door into the mid-morning sunshine. He seems to think Jason is coming for you, Stephen said from his seat at the counter, behind her. She looked to him and he smiled, trying to lighten the mood. She did not smile back. Stephen, she said, stepping closer towards him and speaking in hushed tones. I need to talk to you. There's something you don't know about Jessica. Something you should know. She was going to tell you herself, but... But there may not be enough time. If you still care about her, if you want to make things better between you two, we should talk. Stephen sat up straight, unable to believe what he was hearing. Okay, let's talk. Diana glanced around as a fresh group of customers entered the Joey B's and shook her head. Not here. Come by my house tonight at 11. Don't be late. I won't be, he said to her back as she turned and walked briskly away. He stared after her, his head spinning with a new sense of purpose and hope. Maybe things really did turn out all right sometimes. Tonight was going to be a good night.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Interlude 1 and Chapter 3 of Jason Goes to Hell by Jeremy Terry. Sorry it took me a few days to get it out. Things have been crazy over here. Uh, we were in the totality zone of the eclipse, so I was a little tied up Monday. Then it started storming, and it's still storming and raining now, even though it's supposed to be over. But I said I'd get these chapters done, and damn it, I'm going to. And uh, I'll probably get chapters 4 and 5 out very soon. Uh, because just like you, this is my first time reading the book, and I'm enjoying the hell out of it. Jeremy's knocking it out of the park. Uh, out of all the Jason movies, this one feels like the hardest to novelize, and he's doing a good job of it. Um, I enjoyed meeting more of the cast of characters tonight, like Shelby and Joey. I love that couple. I always felt like maybe they were a beard couple, you know? Like maybe they were best friends in high school, and... They said if they weren't married by a certain age, they would marry each other. And when they did, they actually fell in love, had a kid. Uh, you know, but who cares? Who cares if Shelby seems like he is a certain way? The fact is they're married, they make out, they kiss, and they seem like they're happy. So we're going to leave it at that. Um, but I really enjoy Leslie Jordan. He was one of my favorite character actors. Everything he did was fun. If you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend checking out his appearance on Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman from the 90s with Dean Cain. He was hilariously good in that. Hilariously good. Um, Creighton Duke is here. I love his story. I hope we get a lot more backstory on Creighton Duke from Jeremy. I know a lot of people want to get into his backstory with his girlfriend being killed by Jason. I think that's what it is. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Uh, I loved having the interlude from Elias, and I assume he's talking about a little book called the Necronomicon. Uh, so, yeah, great addition. Love all the extra stuff that we're getting from Jeremy. Chapter 4 is actually going to include the death of the contest winner here on the channel. If you all remember, there was a drawing that was held earlier this year where I said one of you could be one of Jason's victims in the book. Well, Rashad Moore was the person whose name was drawn, and uh, he's going to be Jason's uh, victim in this book. And I believe it's the next chapter. So, Rashad, congratulations Congratulations on winning that drawing. Uh, be sure to tune in for the next chapter. It's going to feature you. And uh, you get to join the ranks of me, Sean, and Alex, uh, all being victims of Jason in this book. Um yeah, I'm excited to, to dive into this one deeper, uh, see what Jeremy does with the body hopping stuff. Maybe uh, we'll get you know some really cool details with Creighton Duke and the interludes with Elias. And maybe we'll find out why Jason wanted to strip that one guy down naked and shave him, or how Jason was able to talk whenever he's possessing that one deputy, Josh or whatever. Um, yeah, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Really enjoying this one. I'm also going to be narrating a short story by Rashad. Well, it's not really a short story. It's an original Friday the 13th story called A Good Day to Die. Uh, it also takes place in the winter, I'm told. Uh, I'm wanting to read that for the first time as I narrate it as well. And I have finished my outline and developed all the characters that I'm going to feature in Celestial Slumber, my Nightmare on Elm Street uh original story that gives us Freddy in space, finally. I've got some great dreams cooked up, great nightmares for the characters, uh, a very diverse cast of characters. It is a salvage and retrieval crew, you know, that gets sent to uh, retrieve stuff from Old Earth or, uh, you know, go there to find artifacts they can sell and things like that. It's a ragtag group of people. And what I have planned for the nightmares and what happens... Uh, towards the end of the book, uh, when Freddy, I don't, I don't want to give away the tag, but y'all remember the tag in Jason X, Evil Gets an Upgrade? Just imagine something kind of like that. I uh, got some great stuff planned, and I think you're all going to enjoy it. Uh, if you haven't done so, if you're going to listen to my Celestial Slumber book, uh, give the Jason X books a listen, because something that happens in Jason X number 5 to the third power uh, so the ending of that book is going to tie into the ending of my Celestial Slumber uh, Freddy book. Uh, I'll do my best to explain for those who don't listen to the Jason X books, 
Uh, I just hope you all enjoy it. So great stuff coming. More chapters of Jason Goes to Hell dropping very soon with chapters four and five. Um, Jeremy's on a roll with this one, and I gotta say, it has exceeded my expectations. Please let me know what you all thought of tonight's interlude and chapter and the book in general so far. And uh, I love hearing from y'all and talking to you all in the comments. Please consider helping the channel through Patreon, PayPal, Cash App, or Cameo. All the information below. We really cannot keep this channel going without you. Uh, until next time, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon. Landis bustled at Duke's familiar...